a continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. And the high priest Caiaphas said to Jesus, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us if thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, Thou hast said it, I am. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God and coming in the clouds of heaven and in another place. And when the Son of Man shall come in his majesty and all his angels with him, then shall he sit upon the seat of his majesty and all nations shall be gathered together before him. And he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd separateth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say to them that shall be on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he shall say to them also that shall be on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. So far, the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Now, in the creed, in the creed, we profess that his majesty, Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, will come again to judge the living and the dead. The dies irae, that haunting sequence used on All Souls Day and in Requiem Masses, puts it like this. Note the universals. Note the use of the universals in this hymn. Oh, what fear man's bosom rendeth when from heaven the judge descendeth, on whose sentence all dependeth. Wondrous sound the trumpet flingeth, through earth's sepulchres it ringeth, all before the throne it bringeth. Death is struck and nature quaking, all creation is awaking, to its judge an answer making. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all hath been recorded. Then shall judgment be awarded. When the judge his seat attaineth, each hidden deed arraigneth. Nothing unavenged remaineth. Words from the DSCRA. So we believe that the King of Kings, who is even now seated upon his throne, his starry throne at the right hand of the Father, will return at the end of time. He'll return to pass judgment upon us all. Everything will be seen. All will be known. But why? Why must this be so? Why must he return? After all, upon death, every soul is judged and rewarded or punished accordingly. Why this additional judgment? Why this second coming? Well, in the first place, because the king said so. That's my favorite reason. Because the king said so, and he means it. He's going to do it. As King David says of him in the Psalms, our God is in heaven. He hath done all things whatsoever he would. As we just heard in the gospel, the king told us that he would come back and he always keeps his word. And this glorious return with the king in full regalia, splendor, light coming from his wounds, coming upon the clouds, we call judgment day. Or the general judgment. On that truly awe-filled day, many astounding revelations will be made. Not only in the sense that there will no longer be any secrets among men whatsoever. But also the secret of Jesus Christ. As the king. Will be completely revealed to everyone. It will be a sort of coronation before all the nations of the earth. And all the hosts of heaven. The absolute, exclusive, unlimited kingship of Christ over the entire human race, over all ages, over all the angelic choirs and the entire universe must be recognized and accepted by all. 
Everyone will acknowledge that he has always been their king. Even if many ignored him, neglected him, or even rejected and waged war against him. So on that fearful day, everyone without exception shall bend their knee before him. Both the glorified and the damned. Yes, his kingship extends even over hell itself as the apocalypse states. Christ holds the keys of death and hell Even those under the earth must bend their knees before him. Satan is only God's jailer and sometimes policeman. There must be a lot of policing needing needed now, for he's been released and unchained. But Christ alone is king. There is no yin and yang, no dualism in this universe. There's only one king. Now, what is more? He must come again because only he can resolve the tension present in the universe. Now, when we read captivating stories, do we not find ourselves compelled to keep reading, saying to ourselves, what's going to happen next? We say to ourselves, how will it end? Such stories enchant the mind because they mirror something of reality. In that they have tension present that we long to see resolved. The universe, creation, the cosmos is the book upon which all such captivating stories are based. Every creature has a sentence in this book. The author and the publisher is the triune God. Tension was introduced into the plot in the first chapter, even the first page with the fall of the angels on the first day of creation, and on the sixth day with the fall of Adam, and with him all of created material creation fell. But how will it all work out, we wonder? How will this tension that started so early and that we feel so keenly all around us and inside of us, how will this tension be resolved? Just as every good book has its basic theme, a dominant word, or an idea, has a hero, so too does the universe. And that dominant theme, that hero, is the Word incarnate. It's Jesus. It's our King. Thus, one can only understand this noble and divine theme, this hero King, when the book has been read to the end. And one can look back. Only on Judgment Day, the final chapter of the book, will the complete meaning of all creation be made manifest with perfect clarity. Only when the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens, when the lightning flashes from the beginning to the end, shall we understand the mysterious whys and wherefores of all that happens under the universal rule of our King. Of his majesty, Jesus, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so on that day, cosmology will become Christology. Cosmology will become Christology. On that ominous day, all tension will be completely relieved. And everybody will say, I get it. Now, we know that when each man dies, he's immediately judged by the king. This is called the particular judgment. In which each man is judged separately, apart from all other men, receiving his just punishment or reward according to his deeds committed while in the body. It is a secret, invisible and personal judgment in which each man becomes manifest to himself alone. All that God knows of our life will be made clear to us, leading to a perfect rectification of our minds. No more lying, deceiving, distracting ourselves. We will know ourselves as we are known, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We will know. We will know ourselves as we are known. That's the thought we're thinking about. 
In the general judgment, however, our lives and those of the whole world from the beginning until the very end will be considered together. And this is why it's called the general judgment, the universal judgment. Man is judged as an individual in the particular judgment, but he is judged as a member of the human race in the general judgment. Every action, good or bad, will be considered in light of the whole. Every intention and motive will be revealed to everyone. Wow. So St. Paul says, therefore, judge not before the time. Until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise from God. Now, a great part of the revelation of that day will be this opening to one another of our most secret lives. Now, St. Thomas says the particular judgment is of the soul separated from the body at death. Now, we know the soul is invisible. It's invisible. You can't see it. So that judgment is secret. It's invisible. It's hidden. Whereas the general judgment is of the body resurrected from the dead and reunited with the soul for good or for evil. And it's visible. It's on display. Everybody can see it. And so this judgment is visible. Everybody can see it. Everybody will know it. So the mere sight of the bodies of the just shining like the sun will be a revelation to all the world that these men have done good. Whereas the mere sight of those loathsome carcasses in which the souls of the damned are to suffer forevermore will be in itself a declaration of what their lives have been. In this way, the general judgment can only take place at the end of the world when all is completed and our bodies are reunited to our souls. As for the judge, it must be Christ. It must be Jesus, our king, as man. Not only because the damned cannot come before the divinity of God, only the saints can see God face to face with the gift of glory. But also because it is fitting that we be judged by our Lord and King, Jesus Christ, as members of his kingdom. He is the firstborn of creation. He is the exemplar. That means he's the blueprint, the pattern of all created things. In other words, we are made in his image and likeness. With his passion, death and resurrection, he makes our re recreation and ultimate resurrection possible. He's the pattern by which we will be resurrected. Thus, the scriptures call him the firstborn from the dead. In a word, he is the reason for all things. The scriptures say, and all things were made for him. He is the first and the last, as we've heard, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is proper, therefore, that he be our judge immediately upon death, as well as at the end of time. Now, with the help of St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, let us examine three reasons, excellent, profound reasons, why there must be a general judgment at the end of time. And I think you're going to like these. We need to meditate upon them. They can really help us be good. Number one. The works of man, whether they be good or bad, are not always isolated. They're not always transitory acts. More often, especially in the case of leaders of any kind and those who are invested with public authority, their actions continue to subsist after they are concluded, either in the memory of other men or in public acclaim as a result of the consequences they have had. So we have these actions Actions have consequences, and they live on after them. Why do we have statues in this church? Because these men and women, their actions have lived unto our day. 
Thus, at first sight, a particular secret deed, good or bad, seems to be only a private, personal matter. But it becomes social on account of its effects, on account of its consequences. God has not made us isolated units or atoms in this universe, but members of a society, of a community that is ruled by a king. Thus, in the general judgment, the king examines the actions of man, not in isolation or taken in themselves, but in their effects, in their consequences, in their relation to other men, whether they produce good or evil. So think about the examination of conscience that's been handed out. In that examination, you'll find a list of how we can participate in the sins of others. This is just an example of something that the general judgment will expose. And of course, there's the opposite. All the good that we can do through the acts and works of mercy, those will be exposed. Now, there are countless examples we could consider for you to understand what I'm speaking of here. But let's recall King David. He sinned with Bathsheba. A private act. He was, she was the wife of Uriah. This hidden act of adultery brought many evils in its wake. Murder. Lying. The untimely death of their child. A deadly plague upon the people. And later, division between Judah and Israel. Because of David's sinful action, the sword would not part from his house until it pierced the sacred heart of Jesus and landed in the immaculate heart of Mary. One act of a king. Actions have consequences. These need to be seen by all. What about Judas? We will see the shadows he cast upon the world by his wicked betrayal of our Lord. What about Muhammad? My goodness, consider all the centuries of darkness that have covered the lands infected with his errors. What will his judgment be like on that day? He's affected. He's He's affected so many people for centuries. That needs to be exposed. What about Martin Luther, Stalin, and so on? Now, on the other hand, think about the Blessed Virgin Mary, our mother. By her saying yes to God, she has affected the whole universe. The effect of her fiat upon all must be shown to all. Without any doubt, she will shine as the brightest of all in the general judgment, as the highest honor of our race. The wonderful effects of the saints are still touching us to this day and will do so even to the end of time. I can think of St. Teresa of Jesus, founded the Discalce Carmelites. She was promised that they would last to the end of time. They're now spread throughout the world Producing saints like the little flower. Surely, St. Teresa of Jesus and those like her will be like constellations among the saints of heaven. Filled not only with stars, but galaxies of stars. It is a wonderful thing to be a saint. We will find out on that day Just how wonderful it is to be a saint. Our actions have consequences that affect other people. These consequences need to be made known and judged and rewarded accordingly. First reason. Second reason. A general judgment is needed because many people err in their judgment about persons and events. You've never had that problem, right? Even the wisest of men are often deceived and outwitted by others. Who of us can safely discern the innermost depths of souls? Do we not rather base our conclusions on appearances, which are often inconclusive? My goodness, we pay millions of dollars in our courts of law 
trying to figure out what's going on inside of somebody and we're never quite sure what it is. Only God can show us what transpires inside of someone. And this is what will happen at the general judgment. As our Lord himself said, nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be made known. So God's infinite justice, he needs to be perfectly rendered upon creation. Now consider how there are many individuals that history paints to be great people. I mentioned Muhammad. He's held to be the greatest of the prophets by a very large population of this world. That needs to be rectified. Is he the greatest of the prophets? Is he even a prophet? We need to see that. This was false. The prophet is Christ. 1517, Martin Luther. 2017 is coming up. Brace yourself. There's going to be a lot about he's a saint. He was misjudged. That needs to be rectified. We need to see him for what he really was. Stalin is considered by many as a hero and the greatest leader of Russian history. Lenin's body is still being preserved in Moscow to this day. How many are portrayed, on the other hand, by history to be evil and the cause of great trouble? Queen Isabella, the Catholic of Spain, considered by many to be bad. Her beatification was blocked in the early 1990s. Queen Mary I, called Bloody Mary, the wicked queen. That needs to be rectified. Marie Antoinette, the wife of King Louis XVI. These come to mind. The saintly Pope Pius XII. He's received repeated attacks in our time. Thus it follows that good men are often treated with undeserved severity or that they are unappreciated or even injured in their reputation. Whereas the wickedness of a large number of men remains unknown. And everywhere they enjoy public esteem and trust. With the world according to them, that consideration and praise which is due to the just alone. A divine judgment is necessary that exposes every pretense, unmasks all heresy, and lays bare hidden ruses and all false and base virtues. Every man must know definitively what is really the case. A few lines from the Dies Irae come to our aid. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all have been recorded. Thence shall judgment be awarded. When the judge's seat attaineth, and each hidden deed arraigneth, nothing unavenged remaineth. <coughs> Thus St. Paul exclaims, judge not before the time until the Lord comes. So, second reason. All errors of judgment are needed to be rectified. No doubts about who was good and who was bad. Third reason. To vindicate God's divine providence in the government of this world. All that His majesty has done for us will be shown. He will show us His passion. All its instruments. Every drop of blood will be seen. The scourge. The cross, the nails, the lance, the pouring out of this most precious blood by which he made peace possible between heaven and earth. We will see it all. All that he's done for us. We will see all the wounds he suffered for us. All the masses that were offered to save us. God will show how each man responded. How those who did became saints and worked by God's grace to fulfill this wonderful plan. Now, what is more, at the judgment, we will see that no matter what the fallen angels and men tried to do to frustrate God's plan, he did all according to his will. 
was not, he could not be frustrated. No matter how hard demons and men fought against him and his church, it was all for naught. And on that day, that will be clear. It may not seem like it because we're in the process now. We're in the whole stream of history. And it seems like it, this is not being right. This can't be allowed by God. Oh, yes. Somehow this is part of God's plan. Now, many evolutionists claim that there was no Adam and Eve. Others say that there was no parting of the Red Sea. It was just the Reed Sea. Some say there was no St. Christopher or no St. Philomena. Some say there are aliens on the planets and so on. What about this or that conspiracy? The government has spent millions of dollars on the conspiracy of JFK. There's been a hundred books written. Nobody agrees on what happened. What really happened? All of this will be revealed and laid for rest, laid to rest and once and for all. Somehow God will repay the entire history of the world for us to see and to know from the beginning and to the end what happened. Think about it. The phone calls. The faxes, the emails, the text messages, my goodness, letters, all that is hidden in the CIA, the NSA, KGB, all the secret archives will be revealed and you'll be able to see your file. <laughs> it will be brought to light and how wonderful it will be. And we will all be there, each and every one of us. I know what you're thinking. What a terrible thing it is. What a terrible thing it will be to stand before the whole intelligent universe which God has created only to be revealed and laid bare completely naked. Just as we were revealed and laid bare to ourselves in the particular judgment, so will it be before the whole universe. Just the thought of it makes the bravest hearts quail. Yet we must keep in mind that the particular judgment will be a preparation for that. We will not be shocked or surprised by anything about ourselves that is revealed. We may, however, be surprised at how much or how little our actions affected others. But even more comforting than this is the witness of St. Mary Magdalene. This sinful woman openly knelt, unmoved and indifferent before her king, while all knew her prodigal life, jibes, sneers, whisperings, finger-pointing, ridicule, accusations, and contempt by those present were surely not wanting to her. They were all looking at her. Did she care? Not at all. She was serving her king. She wanted to cover him with glory and honor and love. And if her sins, if her sins could be used for this good, so be it. In her contrition, her acts of atonement and utter devotion, the world no longer mattered except to increase her humility and the ability to atone for evils committed. After going to confession and receiving absolution, it was not in her to despise anyone but herself. Having no fear of man, she wanted all to see her as she really was, as the king saw her, a repentant sinner. Surely there will be something of this wonder in the sheep in the general judgments. Burning only for what may conduce to his glory. They will not quail at the revelation of their secret lives in every detail. Furthermore, even if the sins of the saints are put on display, they will not be ashamed. Because our Lord took ownership of them as they were confessed. The saints were rather the saints will rather glory in the perfect justice and mercy of God on display in their own lives and now readily available for the whole world to see. Let us be sure to leave nothing unconfessed. Two additional lessons follow. These are short. 
since all will be known and revealed to everyone. Since we will all have our moment of complete nakedness before the whole universe, let us then not be intimidated by the arrogance and dark threats of the wicked and worldly men of our time. So many today have their rights and reputations trampled upon and made the butt of jokes. Catholics now are open season. If his majesty is silent and seems at the moment to be asleep, he will unfailingly awake at the proper time. The devil has his hour. Christ has his day. The examination has already begun. The books are being filled with evidence. Witnesses are readily available. God sees all things. Let us then fight human respect and political correctness. So popular in our day. Repeating to ourselves, my kingdom is not of this world. I want to be able to stand on that day and give glory to God. So keeping an eye toward the general judgment will bring much peace, virtuous behavior and patience under adversity and persecution. Put a bookmark there. We're going to come back to that. Finally, third lesson in Michelangelo's painting of the last judgment in the Sistine Chapel. He has a man being rescued from damnation by a rosary. Let us prepare for the judgment by turning to Our Lady and praying her rosary every day. She will help you be counted among the sheep. Viva Cristo Rey! In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.